We're live. We're live. Let's go. Where is everybody? Oh, I want to play the song. Judith Freeman, she's here. Hey, Judith. I'll wait for a few more people to say hi. David Foltz, good to see you again. All right, let's get one more comment in and then I'm gonna get to, oh, Facebook user says hi. Awesome. So there might be a link on the on the video for StreamYard. I'm not sure if there is. Uh, if, if you want your name to show up in the comments for me, Marielle Sipman, Marielle, hopefully I'm saying that right. Facebook user, hello, hi. Hey, everybody, this is so exciting. Uh, if you show up, if I, uh, for, for example, if I show this comment, Facebook user, Facebook user, uh, if you want to show up your name to me, so I know who you are, um, you can either click the, the StreamYard link. I think David might be able to find it there. If not, you can simply just put your little name at the tag if you want me to know who you are uh, in the comments. But good to see everybody. David Foltz is moderating for us this evening, so I appreciate his help. And I'm gonna dive right in since, um, yeah, that's what we do here. So first of all, I'm Cody Garrett, not Andy Panko. Uh, I moderate Taxes Retirement along with David Fultz uh, under the uh, awesome power that is Andy Panko, administrator of the group. David Fultz just shared that link here. If you want your name to show up uh, to me uh, so I can kind of know who you are and even put your comment up on screen, I can do that for you. So I'm going to dive right in. But before that, I am going to share dad jokes. Even though I'm not a dad, I do have a cat. So I'm a dad to something. So I've got three jokes for you today. I'm going to make sure I get the, the best part of the jokes ready. So the first joke was, I thought I'd be able to retire early since I've been using Buffett's investment strategies. But unfortunately, I just found out I was using Jimmy, Jimmy Buffett's advice, not Warren Buffett. I hope you got that one. I thought that one's pretty good. And then second joke is, what did the gardener do after he retired? Not mulch. Get it? Like not much. That's a pretty good one. All right, here we go. Last one. This is the zinger. So my boss, my boss asked me if I was going to sign up for the 401k, but I said, no way. I definitely can't run that far. Get it? Like a 401k, like it's a race. Cheesy, love it. Support from the group. I cannot. This is the first time I can say like below in the chat. Like I feel like I'm a like a social media influencer. This is exciting. So I'm gonna die right in. Actually, before that, let's pretend I just said I definitely can't run that. <laughs> there we go. There's there. That's for you, David Fultz. All right, Teresa, laughing it up. All right, let's dig dive right in. So the topic today, I have a little bit more energy. I have a little bit more energy today because I just presented a two and a half hour plan presentation, plan presentation covering 25 topic areas. So super, super pumped. I always get way more energy after a meeting than before the meeting. Uh, glad that's done and good. So I'm going to jump right in. So today's topic, I think, what, what was the first topic? Anybody remember? I think it was um, how to review a mortgage statement, how to review a pay statement. And then now we're going to do how to review. Mr. Laugh is in the house, David. Now we're going to do how to review a 401k statement. So first of all, 401k statement to you could mean a 403b, which is kind of like a 401k for nonprofits or, um, or, or government employees, for example. Um, you could look at 457s. 457b is the most popular, either government or non-government 457 plan. But ultimately, today's conversation, I'm going to share how to review a real retirement employer-sponsored retirement plan, plan statement. Um, and of course, I've made my own statement. Um, David, also, if you could share the link to that, I shared it earlier in today's post. There's two links there. One is for a recent article I wrote on how to understand, like how to make the decision between contributing to a Roth or a traditional retirement account, 401k, 403b, 457, and so forth. The second is, ta-da, it is the measure twice money 401k plan statement. So we're going to look at a real 401k, real 401k statement. Um, 
apparently for Measure Twice Money's employee named Susan Sampleton. So I'm going to I'm going to go through this and make sure I get all my windows out of the way. Thank you so much. David Fultz is incredible. He deserves a raise. So that is the link in the chat if you want to download um, this document yourself to look at it, or you can simply try to remember your password and bring up your own 401k statement and check it out. So I'm going to go through this 401k statement and really talk about, I've used, I looked at, I don't know, 40, 40 401k statements across 10 different um, record keepers. I'll talk about what record keeper means, but I've looked at a lot of different 401k statements to determine what are the things that you should find on your own 401k. Um, every plan is different. One thing you'll realize with 401k plans is it all comes down to what's in the plan. What's in the summary plan description, the SPD. Um, if you don't know, if you don't understand your 401k, first of all, you should look at your statement and then look at the supporting SPD summary plan description, which you could probably find um, either by logging on to your 401k or by asking your HR department. Um, it's That's typically who the plan administrator is going to be, HR or your boss if you're a smaller uh, at a smaller plan. So I'm going to jump right in. So this is the Measure Twice Money 401k plan. So the be the top of a 401k statement, first of all, you're, you're going to see this disclaimer. This disclaimer is just for me. This is really probably important for me to say today is that any interpretations of this example statement are not considered personalized advice. There's some investment choices on here, for example. Uh, the content is not intended to provide investment, tax, legal, or professional advice. Personal financial decisions should not be implemented based on its content. Do not act without first consulting a licensed investment, tax, or legal professional, which, as Andy would say, I am not that person today for you. So uh, just that quick disclaimer before we look at the real statement. So the top of the statement, you'll see a few, few different things that are really important to make sure, first of all, that it's your statement. You're going to see your own personal contact information. Um, you're going to see your name, uh, most likely your mailing address or uh-oh, I can't highlight stuff. That's not good. All right, just a sec. I guess I'll just keep it that way. But you can see over here, Susan Sampleston lives on 401 Kangaroo Street. Get it, 401k in Roth. Get it, Roth, uh, New York, which is the only tax-free bureau of New York, 98765. And so you're going to see your own information over here on the left side, most likely. On the right side, you're going to see, uh, actually, you're also going to see the name of your 401k plan which is usually the name of your employer plus 401k plan or 403b plan and so forth. So you're going to see the statement period down here. So you can see this statement specifically is a quarterly statement. Um, you'll usually usually see a quarterly statement in finances. Um, you know, there's four quarters of the year or you'll see monthly, which is 12 statements or annual statements. So typically you'll see a quarterly statement, which is really important to understand when you're trying to back out looking at like how many like how much did I contribute to my 401k or how much did the market change in my 401k as a percentage, you're going to be looking at your statement period to know um, whether that's annualized monthly or quarterly. So on the right side here, you're going to see the contact information of the plan record keeper. So just like the word record keeper says, this is the name of the company that's keeping record, keeping track of all the different things going on inside of your 401k your contributions, your, we'll talk about Roth versus pre-tax, you know, Roth after-tax and traditional uh, pre-tax contributions, the earnings on those portions, vesting, which is the employer contributions. We're going to go into a lot of that information here, but just know that the record keeper is the one whose logo is on your statement. So typically that will be like a Fidelity or a Vanguard, a Census, um, or what's the other... Uh, there's a lot of them, right? But you're going to see the logo is typically the record keeper who's keeping track, keeping record of your contributions and how you're invested in your retirement account. So there's three important kind of people or businesses to think about when you have a 401k. One is the record keeper, as I mentioned. Two is the custodian. So the custodian is the one who handles, they actually like has the, the money, you know, has custody over your funds. So just because you see Fidelity, or Vanguard as your record keeper, that doesn't necessarily mean they're the ones holding who have like you know custody of your funds, the employer employee contributions and earnings on those amounts. So uh, sometimes you might have Vanguard might be your record keeper and Vanguard something trust or you know, another trust company might be the custodian. Um, the third, so there's record keeper, 
there is custodian, and then the third is TPA, which is something you will, you probably won't have to deal with as an employee. But the TPA, the third party administrator of the plan, is really going into more of the testing rules and figuring out, you know, making sure that the the plan is really, you know, in its. Um, as, so as, so just to back up a little bit, the plan administrator, your boss, plus maybe there might be an investment advisor on your 401k. They they have to act as fiduciaries on the plan. Howdy, Pat. They have to act as fiduciaries on the plan in the best interest of the employees. So this is actually backing up a little bit. It's really important to understand that your 401k plan is for your benefit. Sometimes even on your statement, it'll say FBO, which is for the benefit of your name. So one thing to keep in mind is that even though a 401k, we view it as our account, it's really, you know, it's it's the trustee of the account is your boss, your employer, your plan administrator, and it's for your benefit. So that's one reason when you move a 401k to an IRA, for example, if you do a rollover, it's actually going to be initiated from the, the 401k custodian record keeper because you have to have permission from the trustee to actually move that money to your IRA. One thing to keep in mind is that even though your money, um, you see your company's name in front of 401k, your company does not actually not hold your money, which is actually a really great thing because if something happens to your employer, you don't have to worry. Let's say your employer goes bankrupt. You don't have to worry about your 401k money being lost, right? It has a separate custodian. You do, your employer does not have custody of your funds. The three things, just backing up again, I keep, I keep backing up. I'm like doing the moonwalk here. I've got record keeper, custodian, and TPA. TPA is something that's more on the employer side, but it's important to know that there are multiple people and businesses involved in running a 401k plan. So on the right side, just the record keeper, you're going to see their customer service number, which is 800-529, if you know anything about education funding, and 401k. So 800-529-401k. You can call the Measure Twice Credit Union to talk about your Measure Twice Money 401k plan. And the PO box is 529 as well. So now that we've looked at the top of the statement, we're going to jump down to the account summary, also called the account overview on some statements. So the big thing you're going to see here is your beginning, also called opening, and ending, also called closing balance for the given investment period, which is usually quarterly. So you can see this quarter, the beginning balance at the beginning of the quarter, April 1st, there was $91,000 in the account. And then by, what is that, June 30th, um, you had an ending balance of 105000 So a lot happened between the beginning of the period and the end of the period. And what you're going to see in between here is a vertical calculation, typically, you know, in terms of the formatting. It's usually going to be your beginning balance plus employee and employer contributions plus incoming rollovers from other qualified retirement plans plus or minus the change in market value. So that's the price of the investments going up and down with volatility. Those, those numbers are changing, you know, every day. Uh, we also call that capital appreciation going up in value or depreciation going down in value. So minus withdrawals. So you can actually take money out of your account sometimes even when you're an employee, sometimes a hardship distribution or a or a, you know in-service distributions, things like that. Uh, there's also 401k loans. I won't go too far into 401k loans, but it's a way you can borrow. You can borrow from your 401k. You typically have uh, five years to pay it back. If you leave your employer, you have, what is it? 60 days. Yeah. 60 days after termination of employment to pay back your loan. Otherwise it counts as a taxable distribution that may be subject to penalty. So I'll breathe a little bit and drink some water. So this vertical calculation again is going to be, you can see on this statement, it's your contributions as the employee. It's usually going to have empl your employer's contribution. So there's two ways an employer can contribute to your 401k, either as a matching contribution or a non-elective contribution, which non-elective means they 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 uh, contribute to your account whether or not you contribute. We'll talk more about um, vesting and employer contributions in a minute. So withdrawals. Um, so this is how much the person took out of the account. Not sure exactly why uh, Susan take, took money out of her account, but that shows a withdrawal as a negative amount. Uh, fees and credits. So usually in terms of fees, you're going to see, so I'll go ahead and jump to that. Um, do I have that here? 
So fees are usually to be administrative costs. Like really the employer can cover the administration of the plan, or they can pass a lot of those administrative costs to the employee. And these are separate from the administrative. These are separate from the cost, the expenses of the funds themselves, the investments. This is the administration of the plan is often passed on to the employees. Um, and just, you know, depending on how, you know, what strategy they've worked out in negotiation. One thing that's really fascinating with this specific 401k at Measure Twice Money is this employee, Susan, actually got a credit, which is very rare to get on your 401k statement. Just to let you know, though, um, this credit, it's called a revenue credit. So this is a very sophisticated but rare feature on 401ks. You may see that's really where the mutual fund company, right? Their fund that's on the platform. Let's say that there's a fidelity fund on the on this platform. Really, they've negotiated to help offset some of those plan administrative fees for employees, partic the participants uh, investing in those specific funds. So you'll see usually a portion of the fund's expense ratio. It's, it's essentially like there's an expense ratio on the fund and you kind of like get a portion of that in return based on how the mutual fund company has negotiated credits with you know the, the choosing of those funds on that platform. So you probably don't have credits. You'll probably see this as a negative fee on your account, but I just want to clarify before the questions popped up. And you can see over the last quarter, Susan's account um, experienced a market value change of 7,000 bucks. Pretty good for a quarter. Um, so now moving into that a little bit more, you have your ending balance here. So 105,000 and you can see vested balance. So vested balance is the same amount. So um, to define vested balance. So if your employer contributes to your account through profit sharing, usually as a matching contribution or a non-elective contribution, as I mentioned, you may be subject to a vesting slash ownership period. This means if you leave your company or you leave your job too soon, you, you, you'll, you'll always be able to take your employee contributions and the earnings on the employee contributions out when you leave, roll over to another plan, distribute, so on. But you may have to forfeit all or some of the employer contributions and the earnings on that portion, right? So for example, you may have what's called a cliff vest vesting schedule. Again, you can visualize a cliff. Let's say um, they say... Um, Hey, if you if you don't work here for three years, right? If you if you leave before three being a, a participant of the plan for three years, then there's a cliff and you get literally none none of the employer contributions when you leave or the earnings on that account. And um, the most aggressive they can be is you know three years with a with a, a cliff vesting schedule. And then there's also what's called a graduated vesting schedule, which is actually uh, I see a lot more often, which is. You know, you'll get an increasing amount vested per year, up to six years of service as the as the least favorable as an employee. So um, your employer could say, hey, you know, every four years you get 25% vesting. And after four years, everything is yours when you leave, including all the employer contributions and earnings on that portion. So it's something that, again, it's it's per plan, per account. You need to figure out hey, am I fully vested? Which is, I would take literally this whole ending balance if I terminated employment, or you know, would I only take a portion, um, would I only take my employee um, contributions and earnings and a portion of the employer, if at all? Um, this is something I, I definitely wouldn't, uh, it, maybe you'd wanna work at a, if you had a cliff vesting schedule, you might wanna work at that employer for the one more month to fully vest. But I, I think most most people don't really, really you know they don't make they don't they don't make job decisions employment decisions solely based on vesting unless it's like a very you know just a little bit of time left to to invest uh, to to vest get that um, employer portion so one more thing about the employer portion is that um, you may have something in your plan called a safe harbor contribution some people call this a safe harbor plan which um, kind of to break it down, it means that your employer provides at least an effective 4% match. So usually this is 100% of the first 3% of compensation um, of, of, of wages, plus 50% of the next 2%, which is a really convoluted way to say effectively, as long as you contribute 5% as the employee, you'll receive a 4% match from the employer. Again, with... Um, 
Um, with Safe Harbor, so there's the matching way to do self safe, self safe Harbor. Um, I'll talk about Safe Harbor, what it means in a second, but you could either do a 4% effective match or a 3% non-elective contribution uh, from the employer, which means even if the employee doesn't contribute anything, um, they get the full 3%. So the employer, if they want to be Safe Harbor, now Safe Harbor really means that there's a lot of testing rules to make sure that the highly compensated employees aren't giving favorable treatment over kind of the average Joe employee, like the Cody's of the world who kind of, you know, that I, you could think of kind of, you have your, your executives, the C-suite executives, and then you have the people, you know, working in the cubicles. You have the, you have the, the corner office with the windows and you have the cubicles, right? They, the ERISA, because these are government mandated plans, you know, IRS mandated, um, government mandated, they don't, they don't want employers setting up 401k plans just for the benefit of the of this, you know, the CEOs, the C-suite executives, they want to make sure everybody gets a benefit from this 401k because it has ERISA protection and it's an IRS, uh, protect, you know, <clears throat> sorry, it's a government protected plan through ERISA. So kind of going beyond the scope. But if your employer wants to make sure that executives can contribute their maximum as an employee, they can do what's called a safe harbor match or, uh, or non-elective contribution to ensure that they eliminate one of, you know, a, a, a part of the testing rules to make sure they're compliant in terms of not making executives more favorable than the average employee, than the non-executive, non-highly compensated as they call them. So one more note on the employer match, this is so important, is that sometimes people tell me, I only get a 4% match, that stinks, right? But here, here's the, what's interesting about how we think about percentages. It's, we don't pay our rent as a percentage of income. We don't pay for our groceries as a percentage of income. So it's really difficult to think about an employer match and conceptualize that. But I've kind of broken it down. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll post this in the group afterward. I think I might've posted a few weeks ago. But one thing to keep in mind is that a 4% employer match is equivalent to over two weeks of additional pay in the current year, right? So if you, if you multiply 52 weeks times 4%, that comes to... 2.1% weeks of pay in the current year. But here's what's fascinating about investing in 401ks is that now you have to think about, okay, that's two and a half, that's two weeks of pay in the current year, but that's deferred and compounding, hopefully for growth, compounding sometimes decades into retirement. So what does that two years turn into? So I've done a fun calculation. So getting just a 4% contribution only considering the employer contribution, just the 4% from the employer, if you were to contribute for 25 years and get 8% annualized return on that money in, in, within your 401k, just the employer contribution turns into nearly three years of gross pay in, or in, in retirement, you know, based on kind of the average gross pay, what you're making as an employee. So what's crazy about that is if you contribute 4% and your employer contributes 4%, that's six years of retirement based on that gross income that you're receiving as an employee. So that's huge. And also one great thing about 401ks, when you distribute money in retirement, you get to avoid the social security and Medicare tax on that contribution since it was taxed on the way in. Um, just maybe you can you know, go back to my how to review a pay statement article and video to talk more about the FICA taxes and how even your, even your employee contributions to your 401k are are subject to social security and medicare tax on the way in but not on the way out in retirement so when you receive a hundred thousand dollars of gross income in retirement versus an as an employee you get to keep more of that money uh, in retirement um, of course depending on your tax rate otherwise so um i'll, I'll post the picture of the the really the the, the true effect of the employer match but just pretty fascinating is a four percent uh, 4% um, over 25 years, an 8% return grows to three years of pay and retirement, a 6% match, four and a half years, a 10% match is over seven years in retirement. So in the chat, if you know where to work that gives you a 10% match, please post it there so we can all change jobs ASAP. Just kidding, unless you really want to. So the next thing you're going to see on your balance, uh, sorry, the next thing you're going to see on your account is your personal rate of return, right? So you're like, ooh, personal, like this is good. This is like what I made, right? 
But one thing that's funny about this, they call it the personal rate of return. But this is actually considered the time weighted return. So there are two different types of returns you may use in finance. One is the time weighted return and one is the dollar weighted return. So what you see on your on your um, account statement is most likely the time weighted return. So this percentage reflects the results of your portfolio investment selections over the given period. So it means that your account contributions and withdrawals are completely are not are they are not considered for this calculation. This time weighted return is just saying how did your investments do, not how did your account do in terms of the change in value. So um, in I have um there's I think I'm about to I'm about to release this article on how to review your 401k statement, but the calculation briefly is for time weighted return, it's your beginning balance plus the investment gain or you know minus the loss um, divided by the beginning balance minus one. So that's a lot of hard, hard things to think about. But simplified, if somebody has a hundred thousand dollars as their starting balance, it grows by five thousand dollars with the investments. If I divide that by 105,000, the ending balance, um, sorry, if I divide that by the beginning balance of 100,000, that turns into a 5% um, time weighted return, right? But now we'll talk about dollar weighted. So if we include as an employee, you're, you're contributing, you're kind of what they call dollar cost averaging in a way, you're, you're adding money every payroll period. So we should expect your return, including your contributions to be higher than that type time weighted return. So while you're contributing to the account, your dollar your um, your dollar weighted return is higher, and this is the uh, here's the formula for that. It's actually really simple. It's ending balance minus beginning balance in parentheses, and then divided by beginning balance. So let's say somebody has a beginning balance of a hundred thousand dollars. They got five thousand dollars in con um, five thousand dollars in earnings on the account, and they contributed ten thousand dollars. So if we add up 100,000, 5,000, 10,000, that's 115,000 ending balance minus the beginning balance of 100,000 divided by the beginning balance of 100,000, that equals a 15% dollar weighted return. And yes, if you're contributing to an account, you should expect your dollar weighted return because it includes the dollars going in. It should be higher than your time weighted return. So again, when you look at these, when you look at these numbers, I also, I really don't get caught up in rate of return on statements because this is such a short time period. We're talking about just a quarter um, in terms of rate of return. Whereas when we're investing in a 401k, really you can see this person's pretty aggressively invested about 92% equity, 8% bonds. They're probably invested for 10, 20, 30 years out where really looking at a rate of return on your statements, probably not gonna be very proactive mentally. Um, so the next thing you're going to see on your page, most likely is your asset allocation. This is your basic allocation, your split between stocks, also known as equity, and then bonds, also known as fixed income. So we just a quick aside, a lot of, a lot of us think that stocks are risky and bonds are safe, but just to let you know, there's, there's a lot more, there's a lot deeper detail there in terms of some stocks are riskier some stocks are you know more defensive or more or less risky some bonds are extremely risky and are highly correlated to stocks and equity in the stock market and some bonds provide a lot of stability and liquidity you can even think of um, like your money market account in your uh, in your your bank account is like a bond right so there's stability liquidity income and growth you have to think about every type of stock and every type of bond has different varying levels of risk and return so be careful to consider be careful not to assume that when you see stocks, that means risky and bonds, that means safe. That's a very generalized term. And it's really important to, again, beyond the scope of this conversation, really understand like the deeper, like the different types of bonds, maybe a future, uh, maybe a future Wednesday Night Live, the types of bonds and the types of stocks and the risk and return measures according to each. So moving down here on terms of market value, um, here we go. So market value of your account, you're going to see now the breakout between, you know, what happened to each of your investment, uh, your, your investment selections within your 401k. So here, Susan, 
in terms of stock, she has she has some money in the Measure Twice Money International Index, which isn't real. If it was real, I'd probably be uh, I'd probably be in jail right now. The Measure Twice Money International Index. She's she's invested in the Measure Twice Money Stock Index. Uh, I guess U.S. and international, and then she's invested in the Measure Twice Money Bond Index. Again, none of these are real. Don't look for the tickers because they don't exist. Uh, but you can see what's nice. It kind of breaks down how much you know. How many shares did you own at the beginning of the period? How many did you own at the end of the period? What was the price at the beginning of the end? You can simply see, right? You can do some calculations here to figure out what was the growth or you know, appreciation depreciation of each individual asset category you own with your new accounts. And then over here, you're going to see how the the market value of each of those changed. Um, and I just want to do a quick list. There's a lot of investment selection, a lot of investment options typically within a 401k. So I'm just going to run those down. Um, so you'll see usually see large, middle, and small size companies. Those are all based on really the valuation of this. You know, the whether it's large, medium, or small depends on really the valuation of what they call um, market capitalization kind of it's not exact but it's kind of like you know what is this company worth large middle or small companies um, and you'll you'll be able to buy value blend or growth um, again beyond the scope of this conversation but like just right there there's one there's there's nine options right there probably in your 401k then you've got foreign so international non-us developed markets and inter, em, uh, emerging markets. So that's kind of like your equivalent of large and small, but on the, you know, you know, based on the different types of countries that are involved. Then there's global markets, which includes the U.S. So when you see international, uh, when you see foreign, you'll usually think um, kind of global, but without the U.S. And when you see the word global, that usually includes U.S. companies as well. Real estate, also known as REITs, real estate investment trust. Other sectors such as technology, healthcare, utilities. Um, you'll see U.S. bonds, um, government, corporate, high yield, or maybe a hybrid of each. Like if you get the total, if you get the total bond index, you're usually getting a combination of corporate bonds and um, usually high, you know, high high grade, and what they call investment grade corporate bonds, and and a mix of treasury bonds with a mix again of uh, risk return and correlation to the stock market. So you'll have U.S. bonds typically, and you might have a global bond option. The last two are really important to understand are target date portfolios and target risk portfolios. So target date portfolios, if you go to measuretwicemoney.com, um, there's I've written an article about kind of how to understand target date portfolios and whether or not they're right for you individually. But a target date is typically you're going to see, for example, I'll just throw out Fidelity. Um, you know, I'm just I'm agnostic to company Vanguard, Fidelity, Schwab, whatever. But let's say there's a Fidelity 2035 fund, right? So that's going to be actively managed, uh, usually with a higher expense ratio than an index fund, but it's going to be actively managed to be really managed over time to correlate with what they'd expect the asset allocation to be for somebody retiring in 2035. So it's not perfect, but um, sometimes if you want to just be that one fund, simple person, a target date allocation could make sense. Typically very diversified, uh, but also there's additional expenses for being a managed fund. And it may not actually meet the risk capacity of what you need over time, moving in to and through retirement. Then there's target risk portfolio. So as opposed to risk capacity, which is your objective ability to take risk in investments, there's target risk portfolios, which is really connected to your personal risk tolerance. What's your emotional behavioral feeling about taking risk? So a target date portfolio is going to slowly over time, well, not slowly, usually when you're like within, um, within when like 30 years of retirement, it's going to start like tapering down to more bonds, less stock. Whereas a target risk portfolio, you just say, do I want aggressive or conservative or moderate? Like how much risk am I willing to take? And it's still actively managed but it's not going to be tapered down in a risk over time. That's up to you to log back in and change your risk over time. So target date and target risk are usually options in your retirement plan. And target date retirement, uh, the target date funds are typically going to be the automatic enrollment unless you choose otherwise, which is actually a good thing because um, it used to, automatic enrollment used to be into like the, um, the stable value or, or money market account 
which was really hurting people who didn't know enough about investing to know, hey, I actually need to invest my money to make it compound for retirement growth. All right, lots of information. My voice is going away. So I don't see any questions in the chat yet. Uh, either that or it's froze, but I, I guess that means that I'm showing a lot of information. That's good. So one thing that's important on the statement that you're going to see is your contribution elections. So this is a very important word, elections. So this doesn't show, thank you. I'm going to take a break to just say thank you so much to Facebook user who said good info. Uh, so one thing to keep in mind with elections, um, I think there was a president who used to do this a lot. Uh, elections, uh, I'm probably going to get kicked out of the group for doing something political. That's not, that's not good. Please don't kick me out, Andy. Uh, so investment elections, your contribution elections is not how it's, uh, not how it's, allocated currently, it's how you've elected to for future contributions to be elected. So Susan has decided moving forward, you know, starting this next quarter in July, she's going to be contributing 75% to the Measure Twice Money stock, 15% to Measure Twice Money International, and 10% to the bond market index. One thing that's really important to keep in mind, if you're changing your elections with your 401k, you need to determine Am I going to change just my future elections or am I also going to use this as an opportunity to rebalance my entire portfolio with this new alignment? So you're creating your allocation pie. You know, this, she, she, you know, she's saying, I want this to be a 90, 10 portfolio in terms of my future allocation. But you can see if we go back up here, right? So stocks have apparently done a little bit better than bonds if, if that was her original allocation. You can see if she were to be rebalancing, maybe she'd rebalance back to her 90-10 and sell a little bit of stock and buy a little bit more bond moving forward. So election is different from your allocation. So it's important. I've seen this mistake many times where you go into a 401k, they've changed their allocation for the future. They said, hey, oh, I just realized I was putting all my money in the stable value, uh, my stable value account uh, fund where I really wanted to be in the stock market. So they switch to the stock market, but then all their money that's in stable value just stays there. You want to make sure if you're rebalancing or if you're, re, if you're changing your elections, make sure that you intentionally rebalance if that's what you intentionally want to do. Uh, I love this so much, David. Thank you so much. So this is so important. So glad you brought this up. So why is the employer match always tax deferred and not possibly a Roth contribution? So as an employee, you can typically contribute pre-tax or after-tax. Pre-tax is considered a traditional contribution. After-tax contribution is either Roth or a kind of a non-deductible, non-Roth contribution. If you have, there's something called the mega backdoor Roth, something you might want to Google if you, if you have after-tax contributions available in your account. But here's the deal. If I choose to contribute 100% to Roth 401k, I'm going to see my 401k is going to, I'm going to look at my 401k and say, yeah, I've got a Roth 401k. Everything is growing, growing tax, you know, tax deferred, tax free growth. Awesome. I'm going to have no taxes when I distribute in retirement. But guess what? I've got an employer match who's given me 4%. But here's what's fun. The IRS wants you to either pay tax on the way in or tax on the way out. When your employer contributes your employer match, guess what? You don't pay taxes on that income when it's contributed by the employer. So even though you see your 401k as a Roth 401k, the record keeper, as we talked about earlier, right? The, the record keeper here, measure twice money, no measure twice credit union, the record keeper, they're keeping track of your Roth after-tax contributions and earnings on that amount. And they're keeping track of the employer's pre-tax contributions and the earnings on that account. The only way, if your employer contributes to your plan, the only way you can truly have all your money in the Roth portion is if you do what's called in-plan Roth conversions. So this is such a great question, David. If you, if you look at your summary plan description, your SPD, you're going to find out if your plan allows what's called in-service distributions, which means, can I take, can I move money around I mean, outside of just changing investments, can I distribute income? Can I distribute money uh, when within the plan or out to myself 
as an employee even before I retire or even before typically age 59 and a half. Every plan is different, has different rules. You know, there's IRS rules and there's plan rules and you have to know if your plan truly allows that. So my last employer, I really wanted to contribute everything to Roth. So what I, I did, what was allowed called an in-plan Roth conversion. So I converted the employer contributions, the profit sharing, the employee, employer match. I converted that to Roth as I was an employee, which again, I received a 1099R to show I did a Roth convert, a taxable Roth conversion as income in the current year. I was in the 12% tax bracket and I wanted to max out Roth that year, uh, including doing an in-plan Roth conversion. So because you don't pay taxes on the way in, when your employer contributes, you have to pay taxes on the way out, either as a Roth conversion or simply when you distribute that income in retirement. How can you ensure that Fidelity is applying the correct amount of gross to the Roth portion of your 401k if your traditional and Roth is commingled within the same 401k? My company forces you to invest your traditional Roth in the same fund, so I have no idea how much growth is related to Roth. This is such an important concept. And I, you know, doing a, a plan presentation just before this, this comes up a lot. People say, hey, well, I, I want my Roth portion of my 401k invested more aggressively, typically. Again, this isn't, you know, this is not advice, just typically because of the favorable long-term tax-free growth. A lot of people, when they're employees, they go, well, I want my employee portion to be in aggressively invested but I want my, my pre-tax portion not to be as aggressively invested or vice versa, whatever you like to do. But within a 401k, again, we see it as one big pool, whereas the record keeper keeps track of different portions. But I actually haven't seen it in a 401k. Maybe it's allowed. Again, going back to the plan, most 401ks, you choose your election for the entire account. You cannot choose typically. Uh, I haven't seen good examples of this, but you typically cannot say, I want my Roth portion invested this way and my, my traditional portion invested this way. This is another really good, important key to think about. When you terminate employment, the decision between keeping your 401k where it is versus moving it to an IRA, one of the considerations, there's many considerations. I think Andy did a video on this as well in terms of... Um, you know, whether you should roll your 401k into your IRA upon termination or um, upon retirement is, yeah, one consideration there is if you keep it in the 401k in retirement, you probably want to have a lot more control about how your Roth money versus your traditional money is invested, you know, in terms of risk and return. So it might make sense to do it, take your Roth 401k, your one big account, but roll it over into a separate traditional IRA and Roth IRA, you know, you'd really, that's when you really break out that money into separate pies. If you move your Roth 401k all into a Roth IRA, guess what? You're probably going to get hit with an, like an accidental Roth conversion because there might be some employer contributions and earnings on that pre-tax account. So yeah, you typically can't break apart your Roth and pre-tax, but again, go back to your summary plan description and reach out to your plan administrator and your record keeper to see if you can actually do that in your plan. But it is hard to know how much is Roth, uh, you know, how much growth. So on the mo for the most part, you can just assume that your growth on the Roth and traditional is the same in that circumstance. Uh, I'll show you this. Um, is there another page? No. Uh, so one more thing that might be missing from my page is that you can usually see the portion. Oh, here, actually, here it is at the top of the page. So you can see the portion of your account, not necessarily investments, but you can see the portion that's pre-tax employee before tax, which is always going to be the case with the company match. And then after tax, which is non-Roth, this person had after tax contribution, like non-Roth contributions, uh, and then Roth. So you'll see that it break apart, but typically that's going to be kind of like, you can think pro rata in terms of your growth on the pre-tax versus Roth portion. And we got another question here. When you rebalance and reduce the percentage, is it selling a percentage of the fund or is it reducing future? Okay, so there's two. So when you go into your account online and you make changes to your future election, what it's typically going to do, first of all, it's going to change your future contributions. Like we talked about earlier, like that 75, uh, 75, 15, 10. So your future contributions are going to be, are going to go into those elections. 
But when you choose your election, you're typically going to see a box, a checks box that say, would you also like to rebalance your full account to that allocation? So there's a two-step process, changing your elections and actually rebalancing. So if you change the election, it won't reduce, it won't do any selling. It'll just add your future contributions to your new election. If you truly rebalance, it will, it will sell a percentage of the fund and buy the other fund to rebalance. And because this isn't a tax deferred retirement account, there's going to be no tax consequences to selling, you know, selling funds, whether at a loss. What's good is that you don't have any tax consequences when selling something at a gain, but you also can't deduct when selling at a loss when the, within that account. Did Susan Stapleton's Roth account lose money? Inception to date is larger than, oh gosh, I should, I should know these answers. So Roth account lose money. So one thing here, I think one thing to notice, um, again, this is actually taken from a real account. You can see there were withdrawals here. So this person probably has in-plan, in-service uh, in distribu in distributions. So this, maybe I should redo this statement, but yeah, there's um, typically, yeah, typically the Roth and traditional are gonna be invested the same way, um, but they might've been taking, insert, you know, they may have been taking in-service distributions, taking money in the account and kind of out of certain buckets, they might've been, they, their plan might've allowed them to take it from different buckets especially the after-tax bucket if they're doing uh, those mega backdoor Roth conversions. Do you see many employers that still offer their company stock within a 401k like Enron used to do? Um, not very often. I mean, I guess equity compensation is just a lot more rare unless you're working, you know, typically at a startup or, um, you know, tech companies, certainly there's still a lot of that. Uh, usually I see this less inside of the 401k. I know the percentage. So, in terms of safety after Enron, I know that you can only keep a, a certain percentage of your you know, company stock in your 401k. Most companies are offering company stock in other ways, like ISOs, all, you know, all that stuff, and also uh, employee stock purchase plans. But yeah, I haven't seen them within 401ks uh, in a while. David Fultz says, you know, so Disney still offers their stock in their 401k. Yes. So, uh, so yeah, it's still there, but Again, what's really important to know is that you, you know, you have, thankfully you can diversify, you know, they've changed those rules now because of things that happened at Enron where you, you can, you can really diversify your 401k outside of employers, empl employer stock, uh, without tax consequences within that retirement account. If you have a, a poor, oh, poor 401k plan, is it better to fund it to the match and fund your own IRA, then come back to fund? Ooh, all right. So this is one of those definitely like depends. Um, so again, when you're figuring out whether you should contribute to the 401k, then go to Roth. We, we talk about this order of operations. Sometimes you'll see the bucket of, Hey, I'm going to do this, then do this, then do this. Um, so I would say on average, um, usually again, none of this is advice. This is just what I usually see. It usually makes sense to contribute up to the employer match, right? Then focus on typically Roth IRAs, HSAs. Again, it really depends on the person, right? Uh, I guess I should just avoid even talking about you know, possible strategies because I don't want this to be considered advice. Um, but um, yeah, sometimes it makes sense just to, to go to the match and then go to other places and then return to the 401k. A big part of this is expenses and a big part of this is control, right? And I guess the third piece is if you have some different tax advantages, like an HSA has incredible tax advantages to, you know, for long-term growth for healthcare. So it's not necessarily better all the time, but it's, I, so a way to answer this, David, is you should definitely consider, you know, not just doing 401k and then other stuff. You should really figure out, okay, what's my order of operations based on my own personal desired outcomes as a family? And, you know, what's my personal retirement plan? Um, so I'm going to finish up here in terms of, I probably cut myself off in terms of my thinking. So I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to go too deep into um, pre-tax versus Roth. Maybe I'll, I'll do that next Wednesday. Um, I'll go ahead and tell you that next Wednesday, um, I'm going to talk about the seven options for health coverage before, before Medicare. So um, I'm not sure if um, many of you knew that there's so many options there. It kind of blew me away when I wrote them all out. I was like, wow, there's actually seven, eight. I think there are actually nine. I could come up with options for healthcare before Medicare. Um, so be, before, uh, sorry, not, not next Wednesday, next month, the 
the second Wednesday of the month, I'm going to be presenting on healthcare before Medicare. Uh, one fascinating, one fascinating percentage there that, uh, or actual fact, uh, is, I guess that's the re redundant actual fact over 70% of people retire before they reach Medicare. So this is, I think the topic next month, when I present the second Wednesday of the month, uh, at the same time, uh, this is something that like, we, we don't really think about, um, we, we think about people retiring for Medicare kind of like, oh, those are re early retirees. But in reality, a lot of people retire early, um, like not voluntarily, right? Like whether it's medical or, you know, they get laid off. Like it's really, I think it's going to be really important for us to understand these options for healthcare before Medicare, even if you don't plan to retire early, uh, you, whether you're in the fire movement or thinking more traditional retirement. Looking forward to healthcare before Medicare. Thank you so much. I'm also going to be covering... So, you know, I'll just use the next few minutes to kind of advertise what we'll talk about just to give you a glimpse. We're going to be talking about, you know, those seven options, continued coverage. We'll talk about COBRA. We'll talk about ret retiree healthcare. We'll talk about ACA, the marketplace. We'll talk about premium tax credits, the subsidies, what things you should think about in terms of asset tax location, controlling taxable income to get the biggest bang for your buck in terms of healthcare subsidies. We'll talk about the subsidy cliff that's been temporarily removed for ACA credits. If this all sounds like really crazy and like different language to you, like even better, like I'm going to really like break these down, uh, really take complex, really complex topics and simplify them for us. Um, but we'll, um, we'll also talk a little bit about when Medicare hits, like how does, you know, Irma and how does, how does your income and retirement affect your healthcare cost, uh, whether you're in Medicare or before. Are there any questions before? I think I'm going to let you off early so you can have dessert before you go to bed and have a big bowl of ice cream right before you fall asleep. Any questions about 401k statements specifically? And maybe I'll cover more of traditional versus Roth and how to make that decision on the top of next call. Any questions? I'll give you 30 seconds to chat it up. All right. I'm not sure I understand my employer's contribution. Can you explain the following? Copy from my employer's plan. Employer matching contribution of, on the first 4,800 of compensation, 5.5%. On co oh gosh, that's so annoying. So <laughs> thank you, David Fultz. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, who, who's, uh, uh, if you're headed out the door, I'll see you next month, uh, same time. Um, so again, this is one of those really convoluted, like, um, so I'm going to try to break it down. So employer matching contribution. So the... 5.5% on the first 4,800 compensation, compensation over 4,811%. Yeah, that's really convoluted. Um, that's something where I would definitely talk with the plan administrator and just say, you know, what I would say is, how much do I need to contribute to get the full match? And that's, <laughs> that's kind of like where I'd go. Uh, you know, that's how far I'd go there. Um, again, I, I think that most of these matching, it's just a really silly way, typically for the, for the employer to say, okay, well, um, you know, I'm going to make them like, how can I make it where you know, we can be, whether or not you're safe Harbor, how, you know, how much should they contribute before I really contribute a lot as an employee, uh, employer. One thing that is good about employer match is at least as it, it incentivizes the, the employer match is incredible that it, it incentivizes employees to actually learn about personal finance sometimes for the first time. So I, I used to educate employees, plan participants, and the employer match was literally the gateway to somebody learning about money for the first time, right? So this is an incredible, I wish, it's funny, I was thinking about Twitter space, on Twitter spaces, what's great is like people, like, you know, they shoot up hearts and like high fives when it's like, like, I would love to, I would love to know, like, you know, how many of you like learned about money for the first time through contributing to your 401k? Because I think for a lot of plan participants, that was their first time really understanding and vet, like, really having to learn about investing for the first time. Like what is a, you know, what's traditional, what's Roth? Like, I think that if you know somebody who's, you know, you know, kind of gotten their first job, they've, they're, they're eligible for their 401k. This is an incredible opportunity either to become educated or to kind of drop the ball. So I think that, you know, if you know anybody who's starting their first job, uh, I've got, again, this is, 
I just, you know, I pump out my own information because I love just, you know, have, sharing things with generosity and transparency. So measuretwicemoney.com. Uh, I have articles on there that are how to choose between Roth and pre-tax, how to understand your 401k statement. I'm going to post that this week, how to understand your pay statement. Really me. I love it. Uh, so if you want to go deeper, like really go beyond the basics with your own education, or if you know other people, you know, other people, your kids, even your grandkids who you really wish knew this information, uh, measure twice money.com is just a, everything's free. I'm not going to sell you anything. It's just free education that goes beyond the basics of all the stuff I wish I knew before I was a certified financial planner. Uh, four years ago, I didn't know what an IRA was. And here I am presenting to all of you fine folks who probably know way more than I know uh, in a lot of these topic areas. So I'm going to let you go for the evening, but I appreciated everybody being here and I'll see you one month from now. We're going to finish up Roth versus pre-tax, how to make that decision. And then the seven options for healthcare coverage before Medicare. I'll see you guys. Take care. And I'll stay, I'll stick around for the comments if you really want me to see all the good stuff. There we go. I love it. I just want to make sure that you're still there and you still are interested in all the stuff that I get. I'm giddy about this stuff. I jump up and down. I, this is what wakes me up in the morning. Mega, mega backdoor Roth conversions and Irma or the lack of Irma would be great. So, all right. Well, everybody have a great night and this will be recorded if you want to listen to it again on two times speed. Thanks so much.